Okay, good day to you all, uh, wherever you are. Thanks a lot for those, uh, for all of you, uh, for coming to FMG session on the dispute settlement and also the appellate body yeah, yeah. Uh, issue. And in particular for those who are joining us in a totally different time zone. Uh, we have a heavy subject. We all know that this is uh, one of the broken legs of the WTO. Uh, and probably the most heavily broken. And also we have a heavyweight uh, panel uh, uh, with us today. Uh, uh, Gabriel will introduce to them. So I won't waste any time, but to give directly the floor to, to Gabriel and then go into the discussion. Thank you, Gabriel, thank you. Thank you, Lou, and hello to everyone. Uh, contrary to the program, um, I will not uh, present the topic for 10 minutes before Alan, I figure that it's better if he goes ahead and I will instead um, develop a few questions that I will direct to the speakers afterwards. This way we keep um, interesting time and avoid duplication. So unless you have disagreement with my suggestion, I will ask Alan to start and be mainly forward-looking, not focusing only at least on the why things didn't work, but how to make them work in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good to be with you all today. Uh, what I thought I would do is uh, put myself uh, in the position of the unaccustomed position of being a trade negotiator for the European Union. Uh, and uh, my assignment is to uh, restore binding dispute settlement with uh, the United States and uh, do it in a way that it could be extended to others. Uh, so what do I do? Uh, I'm to negotiate with Catherine Tai or with Maria Pagan, uh, the new ambassador to WTO. Uh, I have a clear assignment. I have a week or two. A restored binding dispute settlement now that relations are better across the Atlantic than they have been in quite a while. Um, and in fact, dispute settlement was historically accepted by the United States in order to attack the common agricultural policy. But that's deep in the rearview mirror. Uh, right now, we're in, uh, we're in much better uh, a state of affairs with respect to our relationship. Uh, the Boeing thing, 14 years of uh, litigations behind us. So what, what are my tools? What do I get to work with? Uh, I can make changes in how the appellate body operates and suggest those. Uh, another is to work with the institutions. What's the role of the dispute settlement body? It does nothing now other than appoint uh, members of the appellate body uh, on occasion uh, when it's allowed to. Uh, so what, is, what does the DSB do? Uh, should the secretariat have a role? Uh, so in a real negotiation, I would say, ah, I have to give the United States something outside of this negotiation. Uh, I'll promise not to have any digital taxes. And uh, I'm told by the president of the commission, no, you don't do that. Uh, you have to solve this within the framework of the dispute settlement system itself at the WTO. You don't have outside things to, to uh, sweeten the pot. Um, so what's Catherine Tai care about? Two things, workers worker-centric trade policy, and uh, the strategic rivalry across the Pacific. Um, so uh, how do I make the uh, uh, dispute settlement friendlier to workers? The U.S. Federal Reserve Board has in law since uh, the 1970s that it has two goals. One is to moderate interest rates over long term uh, and uh, also um, have uh, stable prices. The other is equal goal to maintain full employment. So I say, okay, I'm gonna put in this agreement that uh, the, the uh, dispute settlement system is to be, uh, have a view towards uh, 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 maintaining full employment generally. Uh, and it can be in the country that brings the case, the country that defends the case, but the workers are important. and. Uh, I hope that that has a, a selling point for the U.S. administration. And uh, 
I'm going to also, I'll deal with uh, non-market interventions by a government as well. Um, uh, maybe shifting the burden of proof with respect to government intervention, something or other, to um, help with uh, the strategic uh, uh, competitive positions across the Pacific. Um, I'll, I'll have the appellate body look more closely at the intent of the parties. Uh, so what would that mean? For, for example, the safeguards uh, area, um, uh, what do you do with respect to unforeseen circumstances, which is stuck in the throat and uh, actually stuck in the entire esophagus of the, um, of the system? Uh, we'll have to work on that. So there can be safeguards. They're going to have to be, sa they're going to have to be trade remedies as well. So I'm not going to just look at plain meaning. I'm going to look at uh, what's the purpose of all of this. And the purpose is to maintain the agreements, including the safeguards agreement. Um, Article 21. Uh, we're going to have to give a substantial amount of leeway to countries to invoke it without becoming obscene about it. So uh, if I were deciding that case, uh, maybe I would say uh, the case being uh, steel and aluminum, I'd say, uh, guys um, in America, yeah, there's a, there's a case to be made that you want to have a certain size of steel industry. We can look at that. Uh, but you didn't do that. Actually, what you did, in fact, was hit your allies. What sort of a thing is that for Article 21? Uh, so uh, we think about what's to be done with respect to Article 21 uh, to limit it, uh, but not expunge it. Um, so what I put in this paper was a Chinese menu. Um, I'm going to have a Chinese lunch today, actually, meeting some old friends. Uh, and uh, the, the menu is very, very extensive, but you don't order everything. Uh, so you pick and choose from among those things. And you say, well, here's a, that's a list of some ideas which are extreme or crazy. Uh, other th and including in a Chinese restaurant, I find things that I would not order, actually. Uh, I'm not fond of chicken feet, uh, but I can see other things. Uh, so, but it's a matter of taste. You pick what you want. And I have not recommended a solution. What I do suggest is that there be a new MPIA. Uh, the EU has uh, forged the way forward, shown the way forward, that uh, now that the US has taken down the appellate body, uh, any two countries, any two members of the WTO, can forge a, um, their own MPIA. Uh, they can decide how to, how to handle dispute settlement. But I would suggest that the EU and the US, and maybe Japan, maybe Canada, maybe others, sit down and say, uh, what should the system look like? Uh, and we have a free hand because it's, it, MPIA is anything you want it to be. It's, a, it's an arbitration. You set the rules. So there's a lot of flexibility. Uh, governance is a political process. Uh, within an institutional, uh, working institutional framework. And uh, that's what we sort of lost. We lost the art of governance at the WTO. We don't have uh, uh, two of the legs of the stool at all. There's no executive branch uh, except for monitoring. There's no, um, negoti no legislative branch uh, except rarely. Uh, it shows up, trade facilitation agreement, it's very rare uh, in the whole WTO history. Uh, so we try to restore the roles to some degree, if we can, of uh, those two branches, uh, which give uh, in the U.S. context checks and balances of the way the U.S. Constitution is set up. Um, the bottom line, I think we need binding two-stage uh, dispute settlement. Uh, I don't think it's impossible to get there, but it's a, it's a steep hill to climb. We need some rulemaking capability, so we have to stimulate that. Uh, in other words, uh, there has to be some role for the DSB or the general counsel or both. They are the same, actually. Uh, and uh, I know chairs, past chairs of the, of the dispute settlement body have left Geneva saying, I wish I could have done more. Uh, they are very frustrated with the role that they were given. Um, so three things we need, binding dispute settlement, rulemaking capability, at least in the area of, of settling disputes, 
uh, a functioning executive, and of course, a lot of circuit breakers. Before you get into a case uh, and spend 14 years throwing things at each other, in the US and the UK case of Airbus and uh, Boeing, uh, you have a mandatory intervention by the director general. Uh, you do a number of things that uh, restore consultations to their the role that they were intended uh, to be. Uh, that um, uh, you're supposed to really, this is a dispute settlement system and it is actually became a litigation system, which is a different thing, a different animal. Uh, and you need the litigation aspect but not as a first um, uh, option. So there you have it. That's my, my introduction. You have the paper. Uh, the fine print has uh, most of the ideas, some of which you won't want to order off a Chinese menu, uh, and some of which you might say, well, I, I could, uh, I'd like that. So there you have it. Look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Alan. Um... Well, wonderful. And me, I love the annexes and your list of uh, what you call the Chinese menu. Allow me, as um, I suggested, a few questions to, to you, but mainly to the first the, um, speakers. So <clears throat> um, is it necessary to uh, make reference or keep going back to the walk Walker process and whatever was agreed there? Uh, you raised, Alan, uh, the difficulty of the fact that EU, US were not, were talking past to each other. How has this changed and how to deal with that in the future? Yes, you talked about the new MPIA, which I especially like. I think there should be many MPIAs, a bit like uh, RTAs. It's a second best, if not a third best, but it maintains rules and it could lead to harmonize MPIAs. What about a new standard of review or a recognition that the standard of review developed in the two hormones cases, very good cited even by the ICJ in the Wales case, using this standard of review for trade remedies? What about mandatory good offices in some type of disputes like uh, trade remedies? And how to deal with the, uh, what you value so much also in the paper, you claim that for the US it was an issue of balance. Uh, the way the appellate body did not respect what they considered to be their right to use trade remedies affected the overall balance. How to, and I don't want to focus on the, uh, the why, but rather how to reconcile this uh, check and balance. And finally, you suggested very interestingly an office, a legal office. And to me, it's not clear how distinct this would be from the job that at the moment the DG's lawyers do. At the moment, it's Miguel, it was Yves Renouf, uh, the legal affairs, rules division, appellate body. Would it be like an um, uh, advocate general office like the <laughs> Europeans have? Or is it? Um, not clear, and I would encourage all speakers, and I'll stop here, even if, like Alan, I don't respect all my time, I think it's better if we all discuss. I would uh, ask all speakers, starting with Peter, to please respect the seven minutes and try to answer uh, some of my questions, and I will end with one difficult question. Alan highlighted the problems raised by the US in their view with some substantive appellate body ruling, such as public body on forcing development, zeroing, we've heard about that. How to deal with these issues that are important for US and, and some others in practical terms? So thank you. Can I go immediately to Peter? Thank you, Gabriel. Um... I'll uh, have a hard time to stick to the seven minutes. Uh, I thought actually we, I had nine, but okay, you say seven. Um, let me try. Um, Alan's working paper um, is a very welcome and much needed uh, thought piece on how one could possibly overcome the current crisis. Uh, uh, this paper builds on many of the ideas uh, expressed publicly on private uh, by scholars and officials 
<laughs> a number of whom are participating in this brainstorming session. Uh, but his panel, his paper um, also contains novel ideas. Um, Alan's paper offers a roadmap for the negotiations on WTO dispute settlement reform. And let me say up front, um, Alan's roadmap does not lead to the dispute settlement system that I think the international community needs and deserves. But I do realize that dispute settlement, the dispute settlement system that I think uh, the international community needs and deserves um, may be out of reach for many years to come. Um, let me perhaps first highlight six uh, points um, of agreement with uh, Alan. First, um, I agree with Alan um, that the WTO and its members need a binding dispute settlement system and that there is a very good reason for this system to provide for a ballot review. Two, I agree that the mere restoration of the appellate body and uh, appellate review as it has functioned for the past 25 years um, and in my opinion, function very well, that that mere restoration is not an option. Um, and that while the Walker principles, and here I already reply partially to a question asked by Gabriel, while the Walker principles may be a good starting point um, for reform negotiations, they would not in themselves uh, bring the degree of reform needed to restore binding dispute settlement. Third, I agree with Alan, that the WTO needs uh, more effective legislative and executive branches, providing for, as he refers to it, checks and balances. And that to the extent that that cannot be achieved, and I'm afraid that is going to be very difficult to achieve, radical changes to WTO dispute settlement, and in particular, the mandate and functioning of the appellate body may be unavoidable. Fourth. I agree with Alan that the reform of WTO dispute settlement cannot and should not be limited to the reform of the appellate body. Um, while Alan's uh, paper um, points, uh, makes this point very briefly, um, uh, the panel process can and should uh, also be improved. A lot of thinking and talking has already been done on this um, and Alejandro um, is uh, with us. A lot of uh, thinking and talking has already been done on this, uh, actually ever since the late 90s. Yeah? Fifth, I agree with Alan that if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it is a duck. And that the whole discussion on whether the appellate body is a court is uh, not really a useful discussion to have. Sixth and finally, and here I may be taking some liberty in reading Alan's paper, but I think that Alan and I agree that we would not have the current crisis if the appellate body had agreed with the United States on the WTO consistency of zeroing and on the meaning of the term public body. The appellate body would most probably still be in business and would be conducting that business as it has done for the past 25 years. The current crisis is, in my opinion, in the first place, the result of disagreement on substantive rights and obligations of members under WTO anti-dumping and subsidies law. The crisis will therefore not be overcome without resolving that disagreement. And, and I think um, Alan hinted to that again uh, in his introductory words, and providing more policy space for members and in particular for the United States to act against dumping and subsidized trade. There are more positions taken by Alan which are, with which I'm happy to agree, um, but you may be more interested in, in hearing um, from me the positions taken by Alan, Alan or the ideas for reforms reflected in his paper I do not share. But let me introduce those comments by saying that I do understand that the purpose of the effort made by Alan is to get the United States back on board. Unfortunately, fortunately, at least in my opinion, uh, the United States, as far as we know, 
wants a dispute settlement system that narrowly focuses on the resolution of the specific dispute between parties and objects to a dispute settlement system that, in the process of resolving a specific dispute, clarifies WTO law to the benefit of all members. I limit myself to uh, four brief comments um, um, of disagreement. Um, and my comments focus on ideas contained in table one of Alan's paper, um, in which he sets out a list of elements uh, for dispute settlement reform negotiations. I do appreciate that Alan does not necessarily support all these ideas. He has just listed them. But first, the uncompromising insistence on 90, 120, 180 day time frame for a ballot review is unfortunate. Yeah? And the idea is to ensure that the ballot review is conducted within these time frames, such as page limits and reducing the number of Article 11 DSU claims, are unlikely to work. Second, the increasing number of increasing the number of uh, appellate body members to 25 will indeed allow for greater geographical and gender diversity and may speed up appellate review. But it will effectively kill the possibility of an exchange of views among all WTO members, uh, sorry, among all appellate body members, a feature that WTO appellate review, um, a feature of um, WTO appellate review that has been most effective in ensuring the consistency of the case law. Third, the proposal to create an office of legal counsel within the WTO secretariat, the proposal to establish a dispute settlement review committee, and the proposal to allow the DSB to constitute, uh, and I quote, special app political uh, expert group. These proposals leave me baffled uh, and raise 101 questions. Uh, to be short on this, it is not clear to me why one would have more confidence in the legal assessment of this office, this committee, or this expert group than one has in the legal assessment of uh, an appellate body when the latter is carefully constituted. Or is it that some WTO members think that they could and would have more control over this office committee or expert group. And then finally, a very good argument can be made for a more differential standard of appellate review. And my colleague here at the WTI, uh, uh, Thomas Coutier, has made that argument. Um, but I very much doubt that negotiating history can be a primary source for interpretation of WTO law. Whose negotiating history are we talking about? There is no officially agreed his negotiating history of the Uruguay Round Agreements. And uh, with these brief comments, I am happy to conclude my initial statement. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think I won't comment on you. We'll go straight to um, I think uh, Mario Matus, who, was, uh, who has an extensive experience of all sorts of things. He was very, very, very important in WIPO SDDG here as a sort of a very experienced negotiators. But me, I know him as a panelist at all sorts of levels, at all sorts of procedures. So what do you think, Mario, of those um, two prior statements and the proposals uh, from um, Alan, uh, in particular, maybe the last one, because that's something we talked about, a modification where panelists and applet body or adjudicators would be requested to look at history of negotiation and not uh, consider it as a secondary source, uh, rather as an equal source. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. Hi, everybody. Um, before, before going in that, let me read something that was written more than 10 years ago. It says, throughout the life of GATT, there was an understandable suspicion that the United States would one day suddenly withdraw from the GATT and create a chaotic situation in trade relations. And this person added, 
During the Uruguay round, the United States argued that it was perfectly feasible and desirable for the outcome of the round to be recorded in a protocol, not a treaty. The United States wanted to maintain the ability to withdraw in the short term. This was written by Julio Lacarte uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And that's why I had this, uh, when I was the chair of the DSB, I have the, I would say the perception that not everybody was happy with, with the system. So what I did is I organized um, consultations, service, whatever you may call it, with different groups. Basically two groups or three groups. One was the major users of the system, meaning by that countries or economies that they have at that time, they had had at least two cases in the, DS, in the DSB. Uh, then the second group was um, the non-participant. And the third was where the uh, member of the appellate body. To all of them, I pose three types of questions. First, what they, do they think about the legitimacy of the system? If the system has gaps or loopholes? And the third one was um, the, if in the system, uh, there is the jurisprudence element. On, uh, on the small groups or the, the ones that were not participants, really they were not very interested in the subject. Basically they were saying, yeah, it's, it's legitimate, but I, I don't use it because it's too expensive and I don't have the technical capacities to, well, to deal with it. However, keep it, keep it alive because uh, I use it as a sort of threat or bargaining tool. In, this, in the group of the users, there were two types of reactions. The vast majority said, look, yeah, this is uh, legitimate, but we need some adjustments, some changes. I can go on those changes, but basically the same, the same concern that the people has now. On the issue of loopholes, uh, everybody or most of the members said, no, there's no, no, no loopholes. Uh, because if there is a loophole, the, the reaction from the panel and the appellate body should say, no, I cannot go in that direction because there is no rule. Hmm? Uh, but to say that is difficult because at the same time, the same people were saying, however, if a panel or a case is accepted by the system, by definition, it has some, some basis, some legal basis. So this, there was a contradiction there. And uh, on, the, on the issue of, um, of um, jurisprudence, most of the members say, yes, there's no jurisprudence, jurisprudence as such. However, we need some sort of predictability. Hmm? On the issue of legitimacy though, um, basically the group was divided in a minority group, basically the US, Chile and others, but very few saying the system is legitimate, but it has problems because basically at the level of panel, they are going, um, I would say, going beyond what is, it should be, should, should be going, doing. Huh? Um, there was a concern of judicial act activism. Uh, there was an expansion of the rights or limitation of the rights and obligation of members. And in the case of the US, the main concern was the zero. Um, all the others, the majority said, yeah, it, it, all this is true, but we have to keep the system and let's go for, for a sort of adjustment. So this is an old issue. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and as, as Alan said, uh, I, when I went out from, from the chair, I really got disappointed because the, well, there were no solution. And this disappointment was particularly with the members at that time, some of the members of the appellate body, because I made a number of dinners with a lot of wine, so to, to soften the, the, the conversation. And at some point when I raised this type of question to them, one of them stand up and said, Mr. Chairman, we are here not to discuss this issue, but to make justice. With this kind of attitude, it's very difficult to have a, a system approved by everybody. Anyway. But I am already late. Uh, try to answer your questions on the, the paper is great. I, I love the paper in general terms. On the M 
uh, what the NMPIA is a very difficult uh, acronym to pronounce. Uh, yeah, I do agree. We have to go in that direction. And if there is an agreement from members that this could be done, but we know that in WTO, nothing is easy. And therefore, even for the non-participant members, it's very difficult for them to agree. And probably they're going to use the excuse of the money, the financial element of this, <coughs> of this a new MPIA. Um, <clears throat> on the issue of the legal, special legal office for, for the council, um, I think it's something that we have to explore because at, the, at this very moment, the system, uh, in any case, at least of, at the panel level, we have usually the participation of three divisions of, 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 of uh, the WTO. One is the legal or, or the rules, plus the, the specific or the specialized divisions. And this creates some sort of, not problems, but but it's not logic. The logic will be to have one single body to deal with every, everything. And nowadays we are having problems with, um, I would say with the secretariat, not the secretariat per se, but the, uh, look, I have a, there's a case where the, the, the consultation of the case started January 2021. And, and the first substantive meeting will take place December, 2022. So this is almost two years. Huh? Uh, so there, there are some issues that clearly are not created a good image, image for, for WTO. I will stay, stop there because it's over seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mario. Um, always uh, right on. Um, I'd like to, in case you're not aware, just draw one fact before I ask uh, when you are to, to, to intervene. You all know that at the last DSB, for the first time, the new U.S. ambassador um, made the, a short statement in favor of uh, dispute settlement reform. But I'd like to just raise one sentence and then invite you if you have comments. She said that we should, she was not underscoring the importance of taking into account the interest of all members in this reform and repeated not just that what the United States want because a true reform uh, need to reflect the real interest of all members and not prejudge what a reform system should be. So I could add as a question how to do this, but in the meantime, um, Yi Wunuya, do you want to go ahead with your statement and possibly respond to questions? Thank you, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so it's a really my great honor huh, and a pleasure to participate in this uh, uh, FMG discussion and listen to opinions of so many distinguished experts concerning the possible reform of the appellate body and the dispute settlement system. Uh, as a starting point, I, I wish to say that I found that Alan's the paper was is very enlightening and thought-provoking. I read it carefully, line by line, for several times. Uh, it's not a traditional academic uh, research literature, Instead, this paper uh, focuses on exploring possible solutions and propose, uh, proposing useful elements for consideration based on, on the author's uh, in-depth thinking and the diverse background and experience. And uh, the research paper covers quite a, lot, a number of issues. Uh, due to uh, time constraints, I uh, firstly share my pre preliminary views from two aspects. The first one is from the technical and the legal perspective. Um, the second aspect is from the uh, a policy perspective. Uh, um, technical and the legal perspective, as uh, Alan said, that this paper contains a menu, a Chinese menu of our elements for possible negotiation. Um, generally speaking, and uh, quite a number, quite a number of elements deserve positive considerations. Or more or less, I think I, I, I would like to agree to name several, such as the, the mediation of DJ or DDG can be increased and more mediation from the DJ and DDG, 
And the number of, uh, of the appellate the members can be increased. Uh, B is from seven to nine to 25, of course, and uh, can be discussed. But I think, of course, the numbers should be, uh, should be enlarged. And the terms of the appellate the members uh, can be and should be automatically extended because this is the problem of, of today's uh, situation. And the DSB can form a, a, a committee to strengthen the, the, the supervision on the issues related to the appellate body reports. So I said, a DSB a, a dispute a review committee and they can monitor and they can have some uh, uh, stronger uh, role to play. But in the meanwhile, I think some elements needed to be further discussed uh, about whether they are legally appropriate and feasible. And um, Peter just mentioned several, and I would like to, 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 to uh, add something. The first one is, uh, for example, limiting the scope of the appellate body review or the standard review to explicit existing obligations. And it's difficult to define what's what is the ex explicit ex existing obligation sometimes in a real dispute. The second one is that, well, and uh, the second one is, or the WTO agreement shall be reviewed, uh, shall be viewed as a contractual arrangement, not a treaty. It's like a, a contract and the interpretation of the WTO rules is like the interpretation of contracts. Well, this would be against the, at, at least to, to my understanding, against the DSU because and those WTO rules should be interpreted in accordance with the customer international law. And uh, uh, another issue is that Alice paper and emphasized very much on the negotiating history, the importance of the history. And Peter already mentioned that, well, where is the negotiating history and who's negotiating history? I would add one point that if we, in the future, Put more emphasis on the negotiating history. This may, in order to today, put more pressure on the future WTO negotiations because when during the negotiations, members would like to try to clear every words, and there will be a, a more and more and footnotes because they want everybody want to make sure that their intention or their their, their, their design are clearly stated in the DF, in the in the W2 agreements, which will further and delay the process of negotiation. Um, another point I would like to add is also concerning the whether uh, to provide AB with adequate secretarial and financial support because I didn't find much about uh, uh, about this aspect in Alan's uh, uh, paper. It seems that uh, uh, other people suggested that the, the appellate board member um, visited 25, they should write reports by themselves, not supported by a secretariat. And uh, this would be, uh, in fact, how uh, would, would it works in effect. If the works in fact is, uh, is, is to be discussed. Also, and the uh, honest people uh, suggest that the cancellation of a collegiality requirement, uh, we, the appellate board member, they should not discuss the cases. Otherwise, should uh, all the other members should be, uh, or the W2 members should be present. This is, uh, well, this reduces the quality of the future W2 uh, appellate body reports is, a, is an open question. The creation of the OLC, uh, Office of the Legal Counsel, is uh, a quite, uh, innovative idea. But I think also, it also seems is problem, problematic and risky in many ways. The OLC is designed to have a wide range of powers, but how can those powers be used in an appropriate way and with the, uh, the approval of the members is a big question. Who will work there and why, and how can we take the OLC's decision or a recommendation as a superior to Appellate bodies. This is a question. This is a question because and uh, what's the procedure to that? So maybe in the later stage and uh, the criticism on the OLC will rising. And then how to solve this problem? So we block the, the budget of the appellate, the, uh, the secretariat because we dislike the OLC? Well, this, uh, I think this is another, the will change reactions. 
So one uh, idea that merit, merits uh, special attention is the voluntary nature of the dispute settlement system. And, those, and this uh, idea was uh, is in page 34 and 35 of the, 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 uh, the Alliance report. I think this would be a fundamental and a systemic change to the current mandatory nature of the DFU. I'm still thinking what's the benefit and the risk uh, would be if this idea is adopted and its long-term implication to other WTO agreements. If finally, and the members agree, okay, the WTO, the DFU should be, uh, can be a plurilateral, not a mandatory. Okay, maybe gradually and the other WTO agreements can also follow this way because I agree, disagree with you on this point. Okay, you can join such as, and some members will withdraw from some, some agreements. This is a systemic implication, but uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the benefit and the risk and need, need to be discussed. So that's the, some technical uh, 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 points I would like to, to make. Also, I, I would like to add that. When you, I would like to, you have two minutes because you're already okay. over, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, okay. Thank you, so far, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I also think I will go directly to the policy uh, perspective. And uh, uh, Alan was uh, quite frank in his, uh, uh, in his report that, okay, and he, he, he mentioned several times and why the US paralyzed the uh, pedal body the, because of China, because of the systemic uh, competition with China. And that, well, I, I would not go to indulge in the discussion with so called uh, and the industrial subsidy and the market, non market uh, economy issue. I just would like to share my personal thought on whether taking, uh, taking the blockage of the appellate body as a leverage is an appropriate way to deal with those so called non market competition. Um, from my perspective, I think those considerations or the argument of the previous and the current US government are misleading and not well founded, or not, not well uh, grounded. The first one is that the US dissatisfaction with that petty body on overreaching has been in existence long before the emergence of the several Chinese related cases. And even before China's accession to the WTO, it's uh, inappropriate and right? reasonable to the mainly attribute the US acquisition on the AB to the so-called Chinese related issues. And as Alan mentioned in, in his research paper, if the fundamental problem is cultural. The secondly, the, the point is that the fact of the China-US trade war in the past several years proved that trade restriction, trade restriction matters, even though they are used or abused at an unprecedented scale. For example, 301 tariff on all imports are not able to solve systemic issues between main players. So in the same sense, uh, even though the US by torpedoing the well-functioned WTO dispute settlement system, get expected trade remedy tools and policy spaces and actively use them as it wishes, it will very possibly not achieve the goal of successfully forcing other members to change its policies and dealing with relevant competition. So those issues, to, to my sense, can only be solved through persistent bilateral and multilateral engagement and dialogue, because it needs time and mutual re respect. Otherwise, this will only lead to a lose-lose situation at the expense of the WTO dispute set system as a whole. Indeed, the interest of all WTO members and the multilateral system are taken as a hostage. So this concludes my, my, my intervention. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go immediately to Yaniv Remy, uh, whom we also all know. She's at the University of West Indies, but was with the appellate body for years experienced litigator Yaniv. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, and thank you, everyone. It's so wonderful to see these faces now that I'm no longer in Geneva. Thanks for the invitation um, from the FMG. Um, I, I think a lot of what I wanted to say has already been uh, touched on by some of the speakers. So I think I will hone in on certain points more for emphasis than necessarily introducing much that is new. I want to thank 
uh, the former DDG for reminding all of us of some of the core proposals and recommendations that have over the years gained traction and some that have fallen by the wayside and seeking to integrate them into a new, more innovative way of viewing this reform process and focusing singularly on aspects of it, bringing in rulemaking as well as adjudication into a concentrated omnibus set of proposals. And by the way, I had to read through each of the three options and realize that actually they're not mutually exclusive. I think Alan said somewhere in his paper that the real task is where do we start? So as I read through the three different options, what occurred to me is option two, which is laid out in quite some depth in the table, actually encapsulates both option one and option three, option one being perfecting the system that we have and option three, for those of you who haven't read, is really focusing on a one tier of dispute settlement. But in that omnibus option two, a lot of the perfecting of the current system is, is contained in there. And also the option, I think my the previous speaker talked about the voluntary sort of opt out, also uh, envisages a process where the parties can actually decide uh, and opt for a single stage uh, dispute settlement system. So just to, a final point on these not being mutually exclusive options. So my perspective here is one as, 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 as Gabrielle introduced this former insider, but more an outsider now with some uh, very specific um, sort of dalliances with the system as a panelist, but also as an observer, uh, being from the Caribbean, a number of people come to me and ask, why don't we find more Caribbean small vulnerable countries involved in this process of dispute settlement. And Mario made mention of the fact that it is expensive, but I think it's more than the fact that it is expensive. I think they feel excluded. I think they feel excluded because the way a lot of the proposals, and this one perhaps included, are framed is as these two large economies or three or four large economies will gain solutions and then everything will trickle down to everyone else. And I want to kind of gently push back against that as uh, an assumption. I think that thinking about creative solutions necessitates that we look more broadly at the solution makers and thinking more creatively and engaging the system more holistically, thinking of all of the parts of it, may make strange bedfellows. I think small countries want a system that's more inclusive, want a system that is more a la carte, want a system like the United States that doesn't necessarily entail going to an MPIA. If you look at the MPIA option, which is a wonderful option for frequent users of the system, it doesn't contain many of the things that still bedevil small state participation. And I say small states, I use that term very loosely because if, if you just look at the number of users of the system, the frequent users are no more than 15. Most of the countries have had one or two uh, sort of encounters with the system, but when they do use it, it's so important that it actually warrants them invested in being invested in a solution uh, and a long-term solution that's going to hold in the center. So I just would encourage when proposals are made and when these processes are being discussed, and I thank the FMG for inviting my participation, that we think more broadly beyond trade remedies, beyond workers' rights, which also engage us, but things like climate change, things like where we need new blood in the system, things where we need to think anew about the role of dispute settlement, um, and things where we think about participation and representativeness as being equally important as coming up with solutions for the major users. So that's the first point that I really want to hint, hone in on, that the clarificatory um, process of understanding how the rules work, which I applaud Alan for, because part of his proposal is, is a sort of creating a a silo between adjudication, but also engaging this, the process and the system so that the rules are better understood as a way of avoiding some of the conflict. That's my first point. Um, the second point, I, I, and I'll zone in now on the specific option two proposals, which I call the omnibus one, is the low hanging fruit. And Gabrielle, you can, you can indicate when my time is really, when I have three minutes left. Um, 
I'm going to zone in on the proposals I really like, which is more, uh, and I hate to differ from my former boss, uh, Peter Vandenbosch, uh, but I actually think a more diverse appellate body membership is a good thing. Uh, I think encouraging more than seven, 25, we may haggle over the number, is a good thing for the system in the way that I think the system should move, which is more a la carte designing uh, dispute bodies, whether it's panel or appellate body that can cater to the specific needs of the disputing party. So whether we get one appellate body member for very uncomplicated cases or five for more complicated ones, this is the system I would actually hark towards. And so more diverse membership would be a good thing. More diverse, not just in terms of geographical representation and getting trade remedy experts, which I appreciate is important, but persons who specialize in trade and issues, climate change, environment, gender issues, labor issues. This is the way the world is moving. And we in the dispute settlement at the WTO have to reflect that orientation as well. I don't think enough was made, Alan, of the process for appointing appellate body members. I think we should move to a system that is less secretive and more open. Why not have a process that is like the US where we have open hearings and we can hear what their positions are because I think the secret to a lot of it is understanding the perspectives of the people we put to decide the cases instead of waiting at the end when we don't like the decisions and then blaming the members who actually have been chosen. The skill set, as I said, I don't think it's just lawyers and trade negotiators. I, I think it's more than lawyers and trade negotiations. I think we need good judges. I think we need to have people who understand how to make decisions. Um, I know, Gabrielle, I'm out of time. I have a lot more to say, but I'm just going to zone in now on uh, the what I don't think should be ever opted out of. And I think Ji Wen Yao, Yao said it, which is I don't think there should ever be an option for dispute settlement not to be compulsory. I think where the stricture should come is how we adapt the specific uh, panel and appellate body for the specific case. And I think I agree entirely that the provision immediately for no appealing into the void needs to be an urgent action. And finally, on the OLC, one of the issues that I have with the OLC is I don't know how it's going to coexist with the secretariat. I don't think the, the proposal really fleshes out whether it will eclipse the secretariat's role, which I think would not be a good thing. I think it, it talks about huge, not just advocate general powers like the ECJ, but commission powers. Uh, the, the commission, instead of being able to bring cases to the appellate body, uh, I think there's a lot of overstepping here. I think a well-appointed appellate body that understands its role. And I think all the fewer from reform should make its way into appellate body members, secretariat members uh, and members, the DSB understanding their roles much better. I think we should focus on the cultural change in the existing structures. Instead of creating new structures, I think Peter mentioned this committee in the DSB, this new OLC that is, uh, that, that is accountable to the Director General as well as the DSB. We're politicizing and we're legalizing the DSB because the DSB subcommittee now has powers of dealing with judicial activism. And then the OLC now has powers to make direct recommendations to the DSB. I think we have to give some more thought to how we keep these quite watertight, but make them more effective in how they're doing their roles. I'll stop here, uh, and I, I would like the opportunity to come back on some of the points I make, but thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. I suggest that before we go to the floor, uh, we ask Alan if he has any sort of comments. And I'd like to, uh, in that context, highlight three things that came up. Uh, interestingly, the proposal for uh, some sort of ad hoc MPIA, isn't it like what Turkey and EU are doing at the moment? An appeal through 25 of the DSU started last week when Turkey is not uh, fully in the MPIA. What does it mean, a dispute settlement a la carte? Uh, two or three people said that. You, Yaniv, insisted that it's not a door to non-compulsory dispute settlement in any area. 
Some people have mentioned areas. Some countries are asking LDCs to be exempted. You say, no, no, no. What does it mean? And finally, one last thing you said that made me jump a little bit. You said, we in the WTO working in dispute, we have to become uh, up to date, trade and climate change. What legitimacy does the WTO secretariat have if most members, especially developing countries, don't want dispute settlement on climate change, for instance. So these are just questions before Alan uh, maybe makes comments. And then I don't know whether the other panelists want to come back if there are no questions or I'll take questions. I think Lou will take questions, but Alan, please. Thank you uh, very much for those interventions, which are very valuable to me. Uh, I was a, an opponent of uh, binding dispute settlement. Uh, I met with Mickey Cantor, the U.S. Trade Representative, on the last night of the Uruguay round and begged him not to accept it. Uh, I was wrong, I think, uh, but that's that's the history. I was uh, worked with uh, the, on the Dole Moynihan uh, d Review Commission domestically um, uh, to have a a safeguard against um, an appellate body and dispute settlement that gone out of hand because uh, it would be, it was all visible ahead of time. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a difficulty of how an, a judiciary remains um, within bounds. I mean, that's one of the major challenge. I look at the U.S. Supreme Court, which is about to uh, spin out of control, in my view, uh, it, before the latest appointment, two appointments, uh, the, um, the chief justice uh, did not allow the court to find uh, health care in the United States under the Obama plan uh, illegitimate because 30 million uh, additional people would be thrown out of uh, national health care. Uh, he found a way under the law to do that. We didn't have that on zeroing, uh, however outrageous zeroing may seem to most folks. We didn't have that on um, unforeseen circumstances and safeguards. We didn't have that on um, uh, dealing with uh, so non-market elements uh, with... Um, uh, an inability to find a public body. Uh, so there was a lack of a political feel. So how do you get a political feel? Uh, I agree that it'd be great if the appellate body uh, in the future had a culture of uh, understanding what the world was like. That's why I would appoint mainly trade negotiators to it, frankly. Uh, it's people from the, from the world uh, that's out there, the real world. Uh, to the extent possible, as opposed to uh, just legal scholars. Um, there are, you have three elements to fix the appellate body, and I tried uh, while I was at the WTO. Uh, one is get different people in, uh, and I tried that with the U.S. government, and it failed entirely. They wouldn't, wouldn't do it. They say people are untrustworthy. They didn't like their own appointments, appointees. Um, so uh, you change the instruction. They said, language, we had language. Look at uh, the anti-dumping code. Uh, it had good language. And you can argue about whether the language was good enough or there was other language that could be looked at. Uh, they said exactly what uh, John Eves just said, uh, culture, change the culture. I don't know how to do that. Therefore, I went to uh, checks and balances uh, and instructions. Uh, and structure. And uh, by the way, uh, 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 Jim Backus came over for a dinner a couple of years ago to the WTO, and uh, he was passionate that everything was okay, uh, there had never been a wrong move by the appellate body, and uh, a, an ambassador from the Caribbean sitting at the end of the table said, Thank you very much. This has been a very interesting discussion. It has nothing to do with us, nothing whatsoever. Uh, 
you know, it's it's uh, between you and the uh, and uh, you Americans and the EU. So um, anyway, I, um, uh, I I would like those who have uh, spoken and will speak, send me written comments. Uh, this is all going to go into a textbook, which appears, uh, you know, maybe nine months from now or a year from now. Um, and uh, I'd like to have it as, as thoughtful as possible uh, before it gets locked up uh, by uh, Cambridge University Press. So uh, absolutely, please uh, send me uh, any thoughts you have to improve uh, this. Uh, it's not exactly a buffet. It's uh, because it's too expensive, too extensive. Uh, but uh, I, I look forward to further comments from others. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I don't see any questions yet. So unless uh, the boss Lou disagrees, I was going to go back around to maybe Peter to give a few minutes to each of the speakers so they can comment on each other or add or uh, until uh, questions from the floor come. Uh, if it's fine with you, Peter, if you don't want to speak tell me, but there's so much that came up. I thought everybody would be interested in adding maybe. Peter? I, I, I think I was the one that went over time um, when I was no allowed problem, to speak. Peter. I gave you my <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'll, I'll keep it very short, but I had a number of other comments um, that I'll be very happy to share with Ellen uh, in writing. Um, uh, I had a comment on uh, the uh, new MPIA, um, but it was very much in line with what I understood uh, Janif to, uh, to suggest. And I said, well, I mean, this new MPIA will be negotiated between the European Union and the United States. And, and where does that leave the rest of the world? And, and how acceptable will it be for... I, I, it may well be the only way forward. I, I, I grant that, yeah? um, but it's an unfortunate way forward. Yeah? Um, one should have a more inclusive um, uh, process. Um, uh, Janif, don't under sure. misunderstand me. When I, when I go against the 25 members, it's not because I don't want to see more diversity in all respects. Yeah? It's because I think it will kill it will kill the exchange of views. And you're very well placed to know huh, how important that exchange of view has been. Yeah? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and but I see that there is a first question. So I, perhaps I'll... Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, well, um, you know, you say an MPIA would be EU and, and US. What about an MPIA between Canada and Jamaica? And... Uh, China and well, US. It doesn't have to have under to be under Article under Article twenty five. That's always a possibility. And and as we, as we all know, the European Union and Turkey huh, have made their own sort of MPIA. Um, one of them is not the case is definitely not coming. The other is is not clear. But um, no, by all means, yeah. Um, it better but, than but, no this is a different. This is a different <laughs> effort. This is really an effort. The first step. Uh, this new MPIA is a first step towards um, the start of a negotiation on the DSU, okay. I, I think. And that, I think, should, from the beginning, be more inclusive, but uh, maybe Thank unrealistic. You. Thank you. I see that Mario uh, has raised uh, his hand, but Stuart has, I think, oh. if you allow me, Mario, I'll pass it to you. And after, um, yeah, so Stuart? Thank you very much indeed, uh, Gabrielle, and big thanks to, to Alan and all of the panelists for a, a really fascinating and enlightening discussion. Um, we don't have much time, so I, I'll just raise my point straight away, which was that I wondered if, if uh, Alan and uh, indeed any of the other panelists could say a little bit more about this idea of, of, of checks and balances in the WTO's constitution, because um, it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's something that's been raised for a long time. And I remember uh, Alan mentioned Jim Backus. Jim was always talking about the constitutional imbalance in the WTO. 
<clears throat> My question is really, you know, is there any evidence that the, the founders of the WTO set out to create a balanced constitution? Um, and is a balanced constitution desirable? And if uh, a balanced constitution is desirable, then it seems to me there's two ways of doing that. You know, one is to um, dial up the legislative and executive branches, if you want to call them branches, which maybe we don't, but for shorthand, uh, as some have suggested, make the legislative and executive functions more effective. Uh, but that's a big ask because you need a consensus to be able to do that. And I'm not sure that we can achieve that quickly. So the, the, the second way, frankly, is to dial down the legislative function to achieve that balance. And I think that's kind of what Alan is suggesting. Uh, I may have got him wrong, but he goes in, in his uh, second scenario to a lot of detail. So I, I just like uh, comments on that because it's something I'm not uh, too clear about. Thank you. Mario, thank you, Stuart. Mario and then Wen Hua both, I think, have questions for Alan before. I well, I, I was about to mention something similar to Stuart, but let me, uh, so I, 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 I trust on his uh, questions and, and, and concerns and the question to Alan. Now, one single question for Peter. Peter mentioned uh, that you don't like uh, to go for the history of negotiations uh, to interpret the rules of WTO, which is, um, to my mind, exactly the opposite of what we should do is to go further on the history of negotiations because at the end of the day, those rules reflect the, the level of agreement or, or non-agreement among members. And therefore, if there was a solution for the sake of, of finish uh, an argument or, or to just to have a, a rule, but in many cases, those rules uh, don't solve the issue or are um, empty. Huh? There's no political will behind the rule. So, and, and to my mind, both uh, panels and, and, and members, got the availability should, should take into account the reality, the political reality of the issue, which was basically mentioned by Stuart. Uh, at the end of the day, this is a system, it's a big progress for civilization. But at the end of the day, these, all these rules, international rules, should reflect at, at, up to some point the, real, the power the reality of power, otherwise will be broken. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Uh, before I go to Wen Hua, um, history of negotiation would be also important for accession protocol, which was terribly important for China in the rare earth cases, for instance, where they insisted on how they understood, how they think they understood the situation at the time. But in any case, when who are you have questions, I think, for Alan before I go to Alan. Thank you, Gabriel. Yes, I would like to take this a good opportunity to, to, to raise a, a hypothetical question to Alan because um, the, in page 35 of uh, his, re, uh, his research report, and uh, he mentioned the non uh, application issue between two members, maybe two members. Uh, uh, engaged in uh, strategic competitions. So just suppose that, well, China and the US, and they reached a kind of uh, arrangement between them, how to handle the dispute between them under the umbrella of the WTO, the DFU, and would that be sufficient enough for the US to elevate the, its embargo or its, uh, uh, its uh, 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 de decision to to, to say no to the selection process and let the dispute settlement system resume as, as before. Okay, thank you. You're finished, huh? Thank you. So let's go to Alan, then Peter. Uh, on a couple of points. One is uh, the... Um, why have an office of legal counsel and why is it any better than anything else out there? Uh, I'm looking for another voice. Uh, why have the dispute settlement body have a, uh, an outside expert group or a, a committee uh, uh, for the chair? Every committee of the whole 
164 members at the WTO uh, accomplishes approximately nothing, uh, unfortunately. So uh, even uh, the ban on uh, restricting exports of food uh, being purchased by the uh, World Food Program, which has, should have no opposition whatsoever, 80 countries say we're going to do it, and uh, the uh, the others, uh, the African group, can't get uh, its uh, uh, consensus among themselves, and so nothing happens. So to, we have a legislative function that's defunct; it, it isn't working at all. Uh, the executive function is, never existed. Uh, now. Uh, Stewart asks a question, which is interesting. What in the world was in the minds of the drafters of the, um, uh, of the DSU, the, sort of the Constitution, uh, when they put this thing together? They, they oddly said, um, and all we have, I don't know if the, the travaux preparatoires do a thing for us. They oddly said, uh, the, um, uh, there aren't decisions by the appellate body or a panel. They are reports. And the reports go to this thing called the DSB. But then the DSB was neutered uh, by uh, a, the negative uh, a consensus rule. Uh, and they sit there. And what you have is a venting of the winner says we won correctly. The loser says we lost incorrectly. And it is of no value whatsoever. Uh, they do nothing. And then in authoritative interpretations are to come from the general counsel. I'm unaware, but Gabriel would know, and Peter or others, uh, Mario would know, has, the, has there ever been an attempt in the general counsel to have an authoritative interpretation of anything that was the subject of a dispute? Plus, the appellate body uh, um, has not ever found a gap in the rules, as far as I know, but I stand to be corrected. So I, I'm looking for another voice, could be the OLC, could be um, something from the DSB. On opt-outs, um, it's another way of dealing with a difficult situation. Uh, I, I don't exclude the possibility of an MPIA, I can't say it myself, uh, to, uh, uh, between the US and China. Xi Jinping at the uh, China Import Expo uh, in the fall of uh, last year said, uh, willing to discuss uh, rules on uh, subsidies. Okay, so uh, sit down with China. Could be others sit down with China. Or the U.S. sits down with China and says, well, if we're going to have dispute settlement between the two of us that's binding, uh, how are you going to handle uh, subsidies? Just tell us what's in your mind. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, that would probably be a long negotiation, but a worthwhile negotiation. So I don't exclude, I don't see this as um, excluding China from the process. China is going to be central to any process. World largest trading co uh, country uh, is going to be central to any process. Um, the, um, uh, and those who have pointed out um, the Peter got it exactly right in terms of what I was saying is that if you don't do anything in terms of checks and balances, then you have to do more to the appellate body. Uh, so, you know, having them, I think it's horrible to have them all meet in public at any time, uh, but it, um, it prevents the collegiality that has been, I think, um, a strength and also a, a problem. The problem being insularity. Uh, if they if they meet in the open, then uh, there might be um, uh, commentary uh, in the press, uh, Financial Times or uh, the the Hindustan Times about uh, what are these people thinking, uh, and uh, there'd be some uh, democratic element put back into the system. Um, uh, now, is, is that a good way to run a judicial system? No, it's not. And in the U.S., the International Trade Commission, commissioners cannot meet in private. I don't think that's good for the, the U.S. International Trade Commission, but uh, it's the way they operate. Um, so the, as I uh, circling back, the more you do um, 
the, uh, sorry, the less you do in terms of checks and balances, the more you have to do um, to the to the appellate body and the and the panels. Uh, one last thing, and that is, is it is it totally impossible to get a solution? I don't think so. The United States has a, a, a worse deal in NAFTA, had a worse deal in NAFTA, and it didn't change it in the USMCA. Uh, namely, it outsourced um, anti-dumping and countervailing duties to a, uh, the binational panel process. Uh, and that is, I think unconstitutionally, uh, the final word, and it replaces the US courts. It's, it's a complete um, exporting of the judicial function to a foreign uh, and international forum. Uh, why did it do that? The president of the United States wanted dairy uh, concessions in, um, in uh, Canada, and the U.S. wanted uh, no uh, investor state dispute settlement. It was not a U.S. priority. So in a context of a broader negotiation, it agreed to something that is far more heavy handed, if you look at it that way, uh, than the WTO dispute settlement ever was. It's, it's a complete abdication of responsibility domestically for administration of our trade remedy loss. But it's, Canada wanted it and the US did it. And uh, it, they were not willing to pay enough to get out of it. Unfortunately, uh, we're in a different situation. NAFTA existed, and uh, the U.S. couldn't uh, or didn't block it. Um, and um, uh, the appellate body doesn't exist. So it's, you start from zero, and you have to build back up, is, is my view. Anyway, these comments from others have been phenomenally uh, and exceptionally useful, and I, I really do urge them to uh, uh, give me uh, more detailed comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Alan. Before I go to Peter and then Yaniv, two small facts. China was invited to the U.S. invitation two weeks and a half ago to start work on a two-stage dispute settlement system. So no way that China is excluded. And yes, Alan, um, a general counsel attempt by EU to have an interpretative decision took place in 99, I think in the context of banana for sequencing and they even alluded to voting. And a few minutes after India raised, uh, I remember its flag and said, are we gonna vote now on other things, including intellectual property and EU withdrew. So uh, Peter. Uh, thank you. Um, in response to uh, Mario's uh, question, comment, um, I hope that we all agree that the task of panels and the appellate body um, is to decide disputes on the basis of the law. Um, and that political reality and the reality of power um, is something for the legislative branch uh, of the organization to take into account and possibly um, uh, for the dispute settlement body uh, to take into account, uh, but not for the adjudicators. Um, now, um, of course, the problem with the legislative branch is, is the institutional imbalance uh, to which uh, the lack of check, checks and balances uh, that has already been referred to. Now, um, to the extent um, that you have to decide on the basis of the law, uh, of course, the problem comes comes up, what does the law mean? Huh? So you in, have to interpret the law. And there I, I agree with what I think is a statement that you made, that interpretation is, is trying to get, uh, to get to know the common intention huh, of the parties that negotiated the agreement. Um, but that common intention has to be reflected in the text. So you have to be able to get it from the text. And negotiating history, people still have to, to, to convince me uh, whose negotiating history are you really looking at? Yeah? Um, uh, this is now on the issue of uh, gaps. Yeah? And the fact that um, the appellate body has um, never pronounced uh, a non-leakage. Yeah? Uh, there's no look. 
Well, I mean, many of you are <laughs> experienced panelists um, or have uh, worked for a panels or the appellate body. I don't remember any case in which both parties said there is no law on this issue. We're inviting you to make law. There is no law. Huh? Um, at least one of the parties thought that um, the, 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 the rules as we, with, with which we work um, supported its case. Now, um, so for the appellate body then to say, what they can say is no complainant or respondent if it, if it concerns an exception, uh, um, the law does not support you. Uh, the law does not say what you say. Uh, and perhaps because it's, it's not there, but you do, you do always rule in these cases. The, the, the non leakage is not a magic solution that oh, every time that one of the parties says there is no law, um, that you can move on quickly and say, okay. Uh, now, so so I, I think that um, gaps, did the appellate body ever found, find gaps in, in, in the law? He didn't pronounce itself in those terms, but he did very frequently find that the complainant or if it concerns an exception invoked, uh, the respondent didn't make out its case, did not have the law um, that does exist in its support. So, um, Mario, that's a very long answer to uh, what was a pointed question. Yen, thank you, Peter. Yaniv? Thank you, Gabriel. I'll be short. Um, a couple of things have come up. I, I think Peter's last intervention sort of inspires me to to think exactly to the type of restraint um, that's being called for. I think uh, the appellate body has been hesitant uh, due to the necessity to decide cases, to leave a, ca a case unanswered, to leave questions unanswered. But what I think is patently clear is that because of this requirement for checks and balances, we're entering into a new phase where it would be okay uh, for the appellate body and the chair of the appellate body particularly to uh, make a recommendation, make a specific uh, proposal to the DSP chair uh, and to the general counsel to settle issues that have not been the subject of a negotiated outcome. Um, and I, I think this kind of was the culture of change that might be useful. Similarly, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the proposal of a DSP chair being uh, or feeling more empowered to intervene, to act on behalf of the body by making very specific uh, findings about members' uh, objections to certain things that are coming out of appellate body reports. I think the answer, and I think the proposal is to give that DSB chair more power, but also lengthening the term. And it should be a requirement that the DSB chair is familiar, the person selected is familiar with case law, is familiar with understanding the dynamics, uh, has a, a lot of experience working with that so that we actually give more power to the structural features that already exist. Uh, so the secretariat, as I said, understands its role better, understands when it is uh, it's going over its mandate. And I think uh, the secretariat has been uh, privy to all of the discussions taking place. I, I think the heads of the secretariat also need to understand when it is that they may recommend uh, to the DSB that these are issues that, uh, that they cannot resolve. Uh, another point that I wanted to make, I think Alan said at the end of his piece is we need more outside voices. My suggestion therefore is not to create new structures so create the OLC, create the DSB committee, which where you're trying to find these new voices, but actually go to the experts outside of the system. Um, I've made a suggestion or proposal coming out of a, uh, a speech that the, the Prime Minister Motley of Barbados gave a couple of months ago, where we need to rely more on our experts outside of the system. Uh, question how these experts become embroiled in or how their interventions actually filter into what's happening in the DSB. And the general counsel is another question, but I really would resist the idea. And I think Peter made the brilliant point of getting appellate body members to politicize their thinking by making 
uh, what they say public, I, I think it's a bad, I, I do think it's a bad idea. I don't think that the role of a judicial decision maker uh, should be uh, something that is a public opinion or something that is uh, publicized in the newspapers. I think the judicial function should remain judicial. Uh, the point about which negotiating history, I agree with Peter entirely. Uh, and the point also that I wanted to, to, to leave with is uh, in your suggestion, Alan, no, I want to get to one point, which was your comment about what the, the, the Caribbean ambassador said, um, which is yes, let the US and the EU sort out the issue. I hazard to say that that was not to say that he doesn't want to, the Caribbean to get involved, is that we don't want blockage by the major system, major users, to actually block our access to the system, to sort of sort it out so that it works for all of us is perhaps a more enlightened view of what, what he may have said. So I'll stop there uh, and I will, I will wait if there are any more comments. Thank you. Thank you, Yaniv. I don't see any uh, other questions unless I miss something and we have three minutes. Um, let me raise two, three points. You mentioned Yaniv, outside expert, outside expert, which is good, but how to sell this to the members who still resist Amicus Curie? I mean, what's the difference? Also, um, another point that I think is important, um, an example is when the absolute body invented the complete the analysis. This was wise, this was good faith for uh, the party that may miss uh, a claim that was not addressed. However, it is challenged, of course, because it was not in the treaty, like the Rule 15. And I, I take uh, one of your uh, point that was also, Alan, about more transparency and make transparent things that are uh, the practice uh, at the moment. And my view, I think you all know it, I always repeat and start saying the appellate body uh, was a miracle. We may not have appreciated its value in let it go. Uh, and there's a need to um, put something back in place, although I believe it cannot be the same thing. I'm, I have nothing to add more, but I will let Alan complete, um, close the, the discussion, uh, say goodbye to everyone. I hope Lou won't cut the line, but I think we still have three a few minutes. So Alan, please, if you have comments on what was said or um, new proposals um, on what was said. Yeah, just to say, uh, I do not uh, subscribe to getting rid of a judicial function. I want to get it back. Uh, and uh, I'm not worried about precedent uh, being uh, disposed of. Uh, the French tried to do that with their revolution. And in fact, uh, no French uh, judge is going to say, well, yeah, all the other judges have come out in one direction, but I'm, going to, I'm taking an entirely different direction. The precedent, lawyers believe in precedent wherever they are. So I'm not worried about that. I want to just thank the FMG. Uh, I think it's a phenomenal uh, group uh, and uh, brings a lot to the table. Uh, and uh, I, I very much appreciate people wading through uh, all of that small print uh, to um, uh, and and giving their uh, their own reflections on it. I take to heart what's been said. I I, uh, I don't disagree with anything that's been said actually, uh, and uh, uh, wanted this paper out uh, primarily to get uh, views of others. So that uh, the handbook that I'm writing, which is a, a, a guidebook to the WTO, is designed to be what I lacked when I showed up in Geneva in 2017, uh, to know a little bit more about uh, uh, various aspects of it. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great educational process. So thank you all. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I've already thanked people. Is there, Ma Mario, are you keen to add something? Wenha, Peter, Yaniv? It was a wonderful brainstorming exercise. We need more of that. 
Thank you to Lou and all his team for organizing. And we meet soon. I think we have a climate change meeting on Wednesday. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. And of course, I think uh, this session, as Alan said, is not uh, meant uh, to agree or to disagree, but to kickstart a kind of discussion, which is already a nice extension of what we have done last year when we discuss basically about why the collapse and, uh, and how important we should restore the apple body. But now it's really to give, based on Alan's excellent paper, just give some ideas, uh, options, and then also the doability and pros and cons. I, I think those are very important. This is of course not going to be uh, the end of this discussion. I think uh, with Alan's uh, uh, paper and also the excellent ideas from our panelists. I think we have much more to think about, to digest, and hopefully maybe later this year we should uh, have more ideas, more papers come in, and then we could start discuss again. And of course, uh, uh, thanks to you, Marcel, for your able moderation, as always. Uh, on Wednesday, we're going to have another one uh, on climate change and the CBAM and WTO reform. And then later, uh, end of this month, we're going to have another session uh, on food security in times of crisis. So which is already prepared, uh, invitations will be sent out very soon. Uh, and after that, probably uh, depending on what W2 may deal, do with this MSTL for in middle of June. So probably we won't uh, organize too many things before that and also FMG has quite some internal administrative work to do before summer break. So if nothing beyond the end of June, uh, end of May, and probably we will see each other after summer break, uh, but I, we will keep you posted. Thanks to you all again, uh, and uh, for staying with us, and uh, thanks to all the contributions. See you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.